welcome back. So uh, we've fallen about 10 days behind. Uh, it's December 17th. Santa would like to get home by the 25th. Um, we're going to see how close we can get. So I got a couple hours here. So let's give this an honest effort, at least for day seven. Then contemplate whether or not we want to do day eight. Day seven, amplification circuit. Based on the navigational maps, you're going to need to send more power to your ship's thrusters to reach Santa in time. <laughs> I misread that. Uh, to do this, you'll need to configure a series of amplifiers already installed on the ship. There are five amplifiers connected in series. Each one receives an input signal and produces an output signal. They are connected such that the first amplifier's output leads to the second amplifier's input, second amplifier's output leads to the third amplifier's input, and so on. The first amplifier is zero, and the last amplifier's output leads to your ship's thrusters. The elves have sent you an amplifier controller software. Your puzzle input uh, should run on your existing int code computer from day five. Okay. Each amplifier will need to run a copy of the program. When a copy of the program starts running on an amplifier, it will first use an input instruction to ask the amplifier for its current phase setting, integer from zero to four. Each phase setting is used exactly once, but the elves can't remember which amplifier needs which phase setting. The program will then call another input instruction to get the amplifier's input signal, compute the correct output signal, and supply it back to the amplifier with an output instruction. If the amplifier, amplifier has not yet received an input signal, it waits until one arrives. Your job is to find the largest output signal that can be sent to one of the thrusters, thrusters by trying every possible combination of phase settings on the amplifiers. Make sure that memory is not shared or reused between copies of the program. For example, etc., etc., final output signal from amplifier E would be set to the thrusters. However, this phase setting uh, sequence may not have been set to the best one. Another sequence might have sent a better or higher signal to the thrusters. Examples, examples, uh, try every combination of phase settings on the amplifier. What is the highest signal that can be sent to the thrusters? All right, so the question is clear. Um, they also, this problem recommends that we use our trusty, dusty int code computer. So I guess I'm copying that across files, which is not idiomatic at all, but whatever. Um, all right, so let's produce a program, verify our int code computer does what we thought it would do. So here we got a program 31240. Um, I'm still debating how, or if rather, there is a way. Okay, here's all my examples. Um, yeah, I guess we'll strip those out of this problem. They worked in uh, problem five. Um, yeah, I'm debating how uh, to, what's it? Oh, how to uh, bring in the simple build tool to all of this and use Scala um, in order to do proper test driven development. That might not be an endeavor for this year, but it might be. Uh, all right, so we've already got an out of bounds error. Let's try this again. 31240. Oh, I get it, because I don't have a 99 halt instruction on the end. Right. 
that's kind of clever. They make you figure that one out. Um, so I can concatenate. No, that's Scala syntax. All right. Um, I mean, I could just tack on the 99 myself right here. Should probably come up with a better way to do this. No? Um, index 99, size 6. Well, that's not good. So this is supposed to read from input. Store emphasis, no. What is instruction 3 again? 3 is input, um, the program counter, and an ID value. OK, and I'm looking at my first example. Where is my first example program? Oh, I'm sorry. This is a phase setting sequence. This is not the program itself. Um, here are some example programs. All right, three, one, two, four, zero. Let's start with here's a three. Does this run? I think I got rid of the parentheses here. We need that. All right, and the run command is Control Shift F10. I'll be doing that from here on, I suppose. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> so I probably want to create a routine to chain um, executes together. Or uh, I could just stuff into execute a list of IDs. Um, mm, I want to create another method. Preserve my own sanity. Amplify. Oh wow, this is always going to be exactly five ints. So, <sighs> mutable list of int. All right. Um, this will take a mutable list. This will take just a list. And I'll explicitly make sure that this is not mutable. In fact, now there's no need to say list, or no long, no need to convert a list to a list. Uh, amplify. Now, why am I creating a method amplify? Uh, I don't know. Um, and then we want phases, which is going also going to be a list of int. No. Phase zero. Yeah, let's just call it what it is. One, two, three, four. I could try to be fancy, and um, but there's no need for it. And if I'd been smart, I would have copied into my buffer stuff. Um, wait. We still need input signals. We'll figure it out. It'll be OK. Memory, no. Program, and we're going to call that to mutable list, uh, phase zero. And yes, this is still missing other stuff. All right, so we're going to be executing this five times. Um, four, three, two, one, and zero. And we're going to be feeding 
I'm missing something critical here and that I'm supposed to be feeding an input into each of these. And instead I've hard coded input. Oh, wait, uh, input has ID. How have I been passing input into this so far? What have I been doing? Execute has been taking an ID and the ID has been going where? What have I been doing with this? I thought I've been loading the phase or the program identifier using this id. I'm not seeing it anywhere here. So there it is. Oh, three. Yeah, three I have been using this for input, as I suspected. So um, I should genericize this. And we'll see in red here. Um, but also, did I see anything else in red? Oh, yeah, I guess this needs more phases. Um, 31240. Okay. But. Um, I'm still missing something here. So our examples give us the phases, but there's a definition of the input range, which I didn't read too carefully because I didn't want to get into that level of detail until just now. And now we'll worry about um, the domain of uh, values for the input range. or the input domain. It's morning time. Words are coming to me. Um, all right. The first amplifier's output, etc. The first amplifier's input value is zero. Okay, so I'm supposed to provide just a literal zero there. Um, let's hard code that. Which brings into question this, right? So each receives an input signal. Uh, I'm missing something. Am I using the input instruction twice? 3 to 15, 3 to 16. 3 to 23, 3 to 24. So it's supposed to take an input followed by a 0. All right. We can we can with some foresight perhaps figure out how to do that. I'm not happy about it. Um, could I declare this as var input? No. So I'm confused what I'm going to do about this. I have an input instruction, but I also know that my input value, generally speaking, well, in the first case, it's going to be zero. Is there any specification that says the first instruction will be a read instruction? Because I don't think there is. I think this is just saying that there will be a, uh, a requirement to read a value and there will be a requirement to read another value. But no requirement that the program has to start with a read instruction. Uh, we can get our puzzle input. Okay, a puzzle input starts with a read instruction. So, uh, valve 
program is equal to this. Uh, Program.sum. Alright, just to avoid cluttering my output too much. We'll just dump out Program.sum there. Uh, not doing anything with that at the moment. Which means since the program can be assumed to be started with a read instruction, um, I'm going to create a new method here, a new function, call it load. Uh, Okay. So this is going to call the input instruction. Actually, I don't have to create a separate instruction for that. Um, so phase four and its input is going to be I okay. We're gonna have a phase three. And then down here we're gonna have a phase two. Down here we're gonna have a phase one. And uh, have I matched up my parentheses? I don't think so. Yeah, this is not the style I wanted to have anyway. Um, here, let's just put a zero at the end of each of these. Uh, all right. Um, this is horrible. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, here's a way to do it. Var output is equal to that. Output. Uh, no? Um, oh, that's because this is not guaranteed to produce one output value. Um, var Fail R is equal to, this is equal to read, value, yeah, so what's my output instruction do? Memory, i.mode, program counter, um, Enter, return, changes the return type of output. Um, I'm going to define that this has to be an int. Alt shift enter, changes this to return an int. We're getting there. This is so not idiomatic, but I'm not sure that I can be bothered at this point. All right, so here we got five phase settings. Um, oh, yes, these are phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, respectively. And we're gonna set that this returns an int value, which is the value of output. All right, I guess we don't need an assignment there. What else is broken? Print line. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Wait, oh, so this has to return a value now instead of having to print line. Um, the print line there was actually useful for debugging, but... Wait, do I have to put an explicit return instruction in the body of a method for it to return? I thought if the last expression inside of a body... Um, I thought if we ended with an expression, it would just be returned. Apparently not. That's okay. All right. Well, if that ain't ugly, I don't know what is. Um, I should rename this. What else? Remove explicit type specification. Fine. Um, you know, we should probably parameterize this, but also rename this parameter. Refactor. A better name for this is signal. Um, save all these phases and the program. Um, but just in case someday I ever have to come back in here and change uh, input instruction number one, uh, single, <laughs> there we go, signal. It's beautiful. Oh, but that's a val type. Um, whatever. We don't need it that badly. We'll leave it. Um, so, run amplify. Probably should have printed out that value. Uh, print line of signal. Should we try that again? Wait, how did this even work? Also, I completely forgot that my phase, my input's going to have some impact on the program. <laughs> so we're going to start the program counter at 2, and we're going to input into memory add 0 uh, the ID. That's what I meant to do. Yeah, now the end of this uh, software, all right, 31240. Again, I'm not sure how that value got produced, but 31, okay. Um, I have a bug already. Spiffy. How could I have messed this up? Okay, first of all, my input instruction um, hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. So if I do an input we step by the amount that's appropriate to step by based upon whatever instruction we invoked. Um, So what's the normal step size for a read? Three and four PC plus two. Yeah, I thought so. And that seems to be seems to match up with our sample program input. So um, what else is there to consider? I'm so confused. Here we're doing an assignment to Rhett. I mean, I guess I could uh, follow this a little more closely. 
Um, you could determine the output signal. The following steps. Start the copy, though run in A. After its first input, provide the phase setting 3. At the second input, provide the input signal 0. After some calculations, we'll use an output instruction. Um, oh, okay, this doesn't provide what the intermediate values would have been. So, yeah, I would hoped that um, the intermediate values would have been provided there. All right, so three gets read into position fifteen, and three into so we get read inputs uh, four and zero into positions three and sixteen, which are these last two positions. A thousand two would be um, an immediate mode add instruction taking sixteen and ten. Sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen. 12, 11, 10, taking a 15, and um, wait, um, this, uh, this takes the value, this takes uh, the thing in position 16, which is a zero still. It adds a value 10 to it and stores it in 16. So then we have a 10 there. Um, oh, sorry, this is a multiply, right? Uh, int code 2 is a multiply. Where'd it go? Hmm. <laughs> Oh, here's my switch. So int code of two is a compute using a product. Yeah. All right, so yeah, this multiplies the value in register 16 by 10. So you still end up with a zero there. And then takes, uh, stores it in position 16. One will add 16 and 15 together. So you end up with a four stored in 15, then we read the value 15 back out. All right, so uh, we're just gonna do some of this in between so I don't like completely lose my mind trying to do this. So first we should get a 15, right? And we get a three. Is there anything more I needed to do to load this? Input three. Ay, 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 this is not good. <laughs> Should dump out the input, the opcodes, um, as well as the memory afterward, after each step. So this is not the, be the cleanest way I can debug. I'm flustered. Uh, because I spent some time rewriting all these programs in Scala and um, uh, I had thought that this might not be the worst endeavor to keep things the way they are using Kotlin and it's not proving to be a great improvement. <laughs> all right. Wait, can I not concatenate? Okay, whatever. I think that'll print out. So we're gonna get an abundance of output here. Um, so three, two, one. Probably should have printed out um, where are the pointers at. All right, um, it's three, five, we're here, this three. Um, 
let's see. I can print these out, right? Do I have to actually use English like list of there? We can do that, but all right, two, three. So this three is where we're at. We just read into position sixteen the value zero. So we do have a zero there. Um, max thruster signal four three two one zero. So somehow I'm reading a three into here when I should be reading a four into it. Oh, that's because I'm not following my own examples here. Um, the error is between the keyboard and the chair. For example, if you were to do this, you could do all the following, but that's not an example. It just used the English word example to specify something that wasn't really the most helpful example. All right, let's try this matching our inputs to our outputs, shall we? My problem was just inability to read English. Um, max thruster signal 430 to 10. What's confused me here is that they've used the word max thruster signal. And I don't think they know what that means. Because um, our domain of input values has been quite limited. All right. Um, max thruster signal 54321. Um, Again, list of wow this is the full program it's we finally have an input program here that's split over multiple lines um, five four three two one there we go let's see if we get uh, oh for input sequence zero one two three four Again, I'm not reading. Again, it would behoove me to start reading. Let's try reading. So what confused me is so far we've talked about maximum values, and yet we have a fixed program running with a fixed input, also running with a fixed uh, phase setting. So, yeah. All right, max thruster signal for this other program. Uh, for this input, one, zero, four, three, two. Uh, should be six, five, two, ten. Try every combination of phase settings on the amplifiers. So you told me earlier that um, phase settings um, had a value between 0 and 4, and your examples don't abide by that? Am I reading that right? Yeah, for its current phase setting, 0 to 4. And then you gave me these examples. Oh, I'm sorry, the outputs um, don't abide by that 0 to 4 rule, but the inputs do. <sighs> Jeez. Uh, I'll get better at reading. Just give me a minute. <laughs> All right, so here we got our program. Um, which is exciting. So we're making a lock pick, basically. Um, something that goes over 
combination of all input values and picks out the one that produces the largest output. Um, I forget how in Scala to do ranges, so we're going to look that up. Scala range. And one, two, three is a range. Um, oh, okay, so I could use the range keyword, or I can use uh, the word two. Um, so the Scala documentation unhelpfully explains that that's a range. I mean, what do you do once you have a range, right? Um, documentation doesn't link to the range type, but it requires you to go find um, it. So I'm looking for what do I do once I have this range? Oh, look, there's O'Reilly. Uh, O'Reilly. Oh, you could assign this range to a val or var type. Um, so, we're going to make an assumption here. Var signal is equal to zero uh, for phase zero. Uh, one to one. Whoops, one to one. Do the following. Uh, signal is equal to math.max. Uh, signal and um, amplify. Well, this is less than ideal. Program phase. No need to call it phase zero if it's going to be the phase for everything. And then we're going to split this up into five different variables in a second. Um, did I mess this up somehow? Oh no. Uh, in Kotlin, I guess I can't use indentation for this. This is uh, Kotlin, right? Probably not. <laughs> um, that must be a Scala-ism. Oh. Uh, OK. I think, oh, yeah, that was a Scala example. That's great. Oh, because I searched for Scala. Just out of habit. Oh my goodness. Alright, we're going to look up a Kotlin range. So, for i in 1 dot dot 1. We're going to run this. See what we produce. So that's just a singleton value, but I'm just verifying that it even executes. All right, five, six, one, seven, two. Uh, and then we're going to do this for the actual domain of values. Uh, so this should also run pretty speedily. Of course, this is not what we're tasked with. Um, what we're tasked with. Four, five. So five of these things nested, and we want to number them. Phase zero, one, two, three, four, and number them here. Four, three, two, one, zero, and then run it. See what's the highest signal that gets output by amplifier E. Uh, 
That's not the right answer. My answer is too high. Okay. Um. Oh, hang on. I'm recycling signal here. No. No, that's not wrong. Um. Try every combination of phase settings on the amplifiers. So I did create the helper method amplify, which takes the signal as zero and boosts it through all the amplifiers. Um, yeah, the value I ended up with did seem gigantic, but I'm not sure where this could have gone wrong. Um, should I take one of, no? Taking one of these phase setting sequences um, would require me to put a different program in here, and I could do that. <sighs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm confused. How difficult is this program to read? Yeah, okay, we'll be here a while if I try to read that. So. An alternative would be to take one of these simpler programs like this one and see if I just stuff the 43210 into it. Um, do we at least get the same value back there? So that's the tact we're going to take right now. I don't really care what the other settings will do to this, but I do care if. Um, Four, three, two, one, zero produces the same output as um, is produced here um, by the first text test execution. Um, are there rules about um, what the phases can be set to? that I can't set two amplifiers to the same setting or something. Each phase setting is used exactly once. Um, so yeah. This is ugly as heck and further not what I need. I want a permutation of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So... Um, So how do we permute, no, how do we, well, permute is allowing ref, um, replacement, uh, but uh, oh, documentation for Kotlin includes permutations. Oh, is one of the sample programs. Beautiful. Um, I just hoped that it was a built into the language. And it's not. So do I have to write the permute method? I guess so. Discuss.cotlinlang.org slash t slash no permutation functions in the library. I'll take a look at the next month. Yeah, so Kotlin X dot math. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm ready for mutation function. Um, okay, I can do that. Oh, but this is Java. Ew. I guess I'm going to borrow the permutation function I found here. Yuck. Alternatively, Instead of writing my own permutation function, 
which would be the fast thing to do. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it would be the performant thing to do. Um, if phase zero in, uh, well, hang on. There's a way to do this to check if any of those values duplicate each other. Um, if set of phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, dot um, size is less than four, return zero. I think that would suffice for this purpose because we're trying to find a maximum value. All right, this is perhaps a more reasonable value. Let's find out how close we are. That's not the right answer. I'm still too high. Ay, ay, ay. So, I'm not sure. Like, I am getting a different number than earlier. Um, like if I, like zero, one, two, three, four, that's five values, Dan. We need to check if that size is less than five. That's more like it. You gave an answer too recently. You have to wait after submitting an answer before trying again. You have 16 seconds left to wait. Ah, yeah, I get where they're coming from, but do 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 do. That's the right answer. All right, let's go on to part two. It's no good. In this configuration, the amplifiers can't generate a large enough output signal to produce the thrust you'll need. The elves quickly talk you through rewiring the amplifiers into a feedback loop. Most of the amplifiers are connected as they were before. A's output is connected to B's input, etc. However, E is fed back into A. This creates a feedback loop. Uh, can be sent many times through um, feedback loop mode, the amplifiers need totally different phase settings, integers from five to nine, each again used exactly once. These settings will cause the amplifier controller software to repeatedly take input and produce output many times before halting. Provide each amplifier its phase setting at its first input. All further input and output are for signals. Don't restart on any amplifier during the process. Uh, interesting. Wait. Don't restart the amplifier controller software on any amplifier during this process. Each one should continue receiving and sending signals until it halts. I'm annoyed. I'm very annoyed. <laughs> um, so I kind of hoped that um, these programs would not be stateful. And this is damning in the worst way. <laughs> OK, uh, to start the process, a zero signal is sent to A's input exactly once. Eventually, all halt after they have processed the final loop. When this happens, the last output signal from E is sent to the thrusters. Your job is to find the largest output signal that can be sent to the thrusters using the new phase settings and feedback loop arrangement. All right, now we have a simple program of a different sort. Um, so.
I see, here's where I had input of zero. Um, Oh, I get it. Here, hang on. It's a better way to structure this might have been um, to declare a signal and then conditionally do all this stuff. Um, and at the end, we're going to return the signal, except not really. Uh, going to blat the return keyword out of there more like it and then I could have opted here to say if all my things are different to do the following and um, for my sanity let's print out the signal with um, this is not a loop yet but watch we can turn it into a loop um, So uh, we're going to first verify that we get this 117312 here before proceeding further. Um, but that'll go quickly enough. We don't. Wait, how did I break it? I'm curious now. How could my rearranging of this have broken it? Can we go back to part one of this? So, for face setting four three two one zero. Okay. I'm annoyed. <laughs> so annoyed right now. All right, I'll put the brace here and just comment that out. Let's see, have I left my program intact at all? Obviously the last, no. Oh, this isn't valid Scala, or this isn't valid Kotlin. I can't just arbitrarily declare scopes like that. Okay, fine, we can deal. Um, all right, so now we got our 43210, etc. back. So I'm confused. Oh, it's because I had inverted the condition. That's how I messed this up. I was wondering why it was slow. This should, uh, at least for the last example there. Yeah, there we go. 113712. And we should still have that. Let me verify. Yep, that still matches. So, um, now we have a feedback loop. So we need a different amplification routine, unfortunately, just given how I structured all this. Um, so we're going to keep our original amplify up here. And down here, we're going to introduce a for loop. Is there any specification on how many times we go through this? I know it says all the programs will halt. I could maybe trust this. Um, fun feedback. All right. Um, Oh, I guess I don't need um, this print line here. 
I guess we know that that aspect of everything works. Uh, feedback of can't reassign to a val, can I? Yeah. Val cannot be reassigned, so we're gonna call it a, no, we're not gonna call it a var. Not until we need to. Um, feedback on list of, here's our program. Wait, what more do I need in terms of this? I need the actual phases. All right. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. And let's print out what we get there. So we get some number ending in 729. That's not it. <laughs> Um, well, Santa stranded. There's nothing we can do. Pack up um, your bags, send the elves home. No. Okay, we're gonna get, see what we can do here. Oh, cause here I didn't keep the loop. I need some notion of whether or not um, a program has in fact halted. That's annoying. Um, I mean, I could just run this some fixed number of times or something, but no, I really do need now a buffer in which to store the signal until um, all the programs halt. So that's great. Uh, okay. Um, can Kotlin have multiple return values so I don't have to do that? That'd be kind of nice. Eventually, the software on the amplifiers will halt after they process the final loop. I, I'm not pleased. All right, at least I've read the program, or a problem. Um, so, well, I was about to say earlier, for i in one dot dot one, now we've got our for loop, and we can print out the signal on each iteration. Uh, oh. But it says don't reset between iterations. So I do actually have to split the load from the execute. Wow. Okay. You win. Forcing me to do things in an imperative fashion. And we'll come back and figure out how to do it in a functional style someday, but that's not today. Uh, I meant to call this load because load is going to do this. And then execute is going to start with the program counter somewhere already. Uh, oh, but I still don't know how to do vars in a declaration in Kotlin. Uh, so we're going to look that up. Kotlin uh, function var. No. Function parameters are val, not var. I mean, I could create a var that. Um, yeah, can I do reassignment? Parameters are now always val and are immutable to reduce confusion. Okay. If you want a mutable, you have to declare it explicitly in the... Yeah, that's fine. That's just a language decision they've made. 
So we're going to say PC0 and then be explicit about that here. That's annoying. It's okay. So return execute of memory uh, to id input. I'm annoyed because now I have to go rewrite this. I had a perfectly working computer and then they wanted something slightly different. So you get something slightly different now. And feedback here is also going to do a load. And the difference here is that now we're actually going to have five different computers. So let's do it. Um, have state represented in our program. Um, val computer 0 is equal to load. We're going to follow our example we had up here. Load load. That's perfect. Alright, computer 0. Uh, and then we got 1 two, three. Oh, this is even worse. Oh, that's so lovely. So load just... <laughs> that returns an int. I require something that's not an int. Um, so I'm going to need to move load into uh, the computer. Now we've got an instruction class. This is basically forcing the person to write a computer class. There's no other solution. The problem is so rigid that it requires you to structure your code the same way that everybody else structures their code. There's no room for creativity here. That's what annoys me. Um, so I've managed to go thus far without, um, well no, my program is represented in, um, yeah, here we go, but that doesn't benefit me any. Um, okay, so load can actually do one useful thing for me. And that is um, produce a mutable list here. Um, so this is going to load a program into a mutable list. Um, valve memory is, I can't even spell program to mutable list. All right. And this is not going to return the execution. This is just going to return the memory that can be loaded into a program. And yes, I recognize that my return type is different now. Um, who was control shift enter? Yeah, no. Alt Shift Enter, that's what I did type a second ago. All right, whatever. Uh, there we go. So that's the load step. So I do have a thing called a computer, except I'm just calling it a mutable list of int. Um, which is not great. So note that this is broken now. Um, 
So instead of doing two mutable list all over the place here, now we're going to execute our program starting at instruction two. So first part of a program execution is going to be to jump to instruction number two. Um, and my parentheses mismatch, and I still do, and this is better. If I save, can this little red indicator there go away? Pretty please? Uh, I don't think so. What does load also require? Because I'm messing something up. Load requires a program, just a list of int, an id, and a mutable list of int. Um, wait, I'm not sure why it requires the input. I'm not using this input. All right. Um, so this has, no, that's the input signal. No, it's not. So they keep calling these phases, and I keep calling them IDs elsewhere, and they keep changing the terminology every time we have one of these computer things. But um, we can at least get this to compile and the tests to return the same value they used to return. Um, so I should be thankful that stuff that software can be composed. That software is not necessarily rigid. And feedback here. All right, so computer zero is equal to load this with phase zero. And we don't require the signal at this point. This is just the initialization step. Uh, phase one, two, three, and four. And then a single time we are going to do this where we execute. Honestly, execute no longer requires, um, what's it, uh, this input instruction here. That's the supposed gain of rewriting my software is that I no longer have to specify that on every execution. Um, yeah. There's still a very tight coupling between these two methods because you must call load every t or before you call execute. And now it's not even enforced inside the method declaration. And this is why you want to have like a class with an initializer. And this would be the initialization method um, that would be called exactly once. But that's why I'm saying that this is this problem is forcing me to a class driven structure, uh, which might not be a terrible thing, but it's just if they could just give me all the requirements at once, that would be better. If they're going to do something that forces my hand in the way that I'm going to write the software, um, I'd rather know about it up front. If you're going to just completely deprive me of all creativity. Um, and dictate the way that I have to structure everything. Uh, at least let me know up front what the assumptions are. So that's my axe to grind. Um, so too many arguments. Yeah, you're telling me. We're having some arguments here. <laughs> um, phase zero. Yeah, you're right. I guess we don't need to have an argument over that one. Um, save. Well, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Eleven 
7312. Okay. Um, at least we got the same outputs for the first half of this, so I didn't break things, despite having to restructure it all. I probably could have anticipated the feedback loop, given the word amplifier. Um, I was just hoping to take some shortcuts and not confuse you all, but it's too late now. Alright, so... There's Amplify, here's Feedback. So here I've created, um, actually this isn't even a computer, this is just a memory. Uh, can I rename? Refactor rename is what? Shift F6, all right. Eclipse has a slightly different behavior. Uh, uh, which is honestly far more complicated than this. Alright, signal. I print out signal there. I get a minus 484. Um, and I know this says that the program's halt. I don't know if I actually believe that. So if we go two iterations, we might get a different number. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> oh, my programs have halted. Isn't that lovely? Your computer is running low on storage space. Yeah. Probably need to get that addressed before the next time we do one of these. Um, so... Um, yeah, these computers all halted on the first iteration, apparently. Wait, how did my execute... Oh, I see. That's how. Oh, but I need to keep track of the program counter now, too. All right. You win. Jeez. Yeah, now doing this without a class is difficult because now you have to have multiple return types. Um, so we're previously, I'm calling this PC0. Maybe I don't want the program counter to be at address zero every time. Um, I would want to return. Um, from execute not only uh, an int but also um, I want the program counter so hopefully Scala has a mutable int or I'm gonna have to write a new data structure uh, I think there is an int buffer Uh, Kotlin has int array, but I don't want to have to declare a whole array just for this. Good to know that int array exists, but um, int buffer? No. I'm sorry, I mistyped that. Int buffer. No, all right. Um, mutable int. There's mutable iterator, mutable iterable. I'm really talking about an array. Well, all right. I guess we're going with an int array. It's not idiomatic.
Oh, uh, yeah, no, I could declare a type and call it program counter. I wanted to get out of a mode where I would be declaring data types that are mutable and I'd only use mutability if the language natively supports it. Um, yeah, so all method parameters must be declared as vals and not vars. Um, Okay, multiple return values, destructuring declaration, but I want a function to return multiple values. Java, Java doesn't natively support this, and I don't think Kotlin does either. So I'd have to declare my own data structure just for this. I mean, yes, this is risky, but this is where Java has sucked for a decade. Um, I suspect Kotlin's going to be there for a little while. So you can do these destructured declarations. Can I return two values from function? Yes, but I need to declare a data class. OK. You win. Um, it's Java-like, but not Java. What wizardry is this? This is Kotlin. So I'm going to create a thing. I'm not happy about it, but it is well structured. I will give it that. State. Isn't state such a great name for a thing? Uh, it has the advantage of being unambiguous. So we've got a list of int and a val pc, which is an int. Um, and there's really nothing more to it. There's getting the members of state, but... Um, so now we can declare that compute or execute or whatever the heck I call it is going to be return a state of PC. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted the return value. That's the other thing I wanted returned. <sighs> Signal is going to be an int. OK. I suppose while I'm at it, I could just improve my the name of this variable here, too. There we go, signal. Return this, Alt, Shift, Enter. All right, so this is going to return a state. And the fact that that returns a state, it's now going to break all my existing code here. Um, so execute uh, all these care about is the signal of the return state. That's fine. And then over here, we have five different memories which represent the actual state of the computer. But now, I mean, I could call my struct computer if I wanted to, or my data class a computer. Um, even though it's not managing its own memory yet, it will be soon. The more and more I'm forced in this direction. Um, so we're going to declare some other variables. Um, so var pc0 is equal to 2. Uh, and we're going to declare five program counters. And again, I'm not doing this ter terribly idiomatically. 
um, PC0, PC1, PC2, PC3, PC4. Now these all still return a phase or a state. Um, so we're going to do multiple assignment. And this is where things get scary is that you want to make sure you get things back in the right order. So you have the program counter and the signal. Um, so when we do this assignment on here, PC0 comma signal is equal to that. So this is a destructured declaration. Except this isn't a declaration, this is a reassignment. Um, just kidding. All right, uh, so I did this wrong again. Um, so I don't want this, I want state zero is equal to state uh, program counter and signal. Okay. This is just heavily pushing me in the direction of not using a data class. Um, or if I am going to use a data class, call it a computer. So I guess that's where we're going. I guess we're going to make a computer. Well, we don't need it just yet. Um, list of int. There's nothing here that requires that the list be mutable. I can still call this a data class. Um, this veers further and further away from being an actual computer, but all right. So load here is now going to return. I don't want to couple all that together. We're going to keep this the way it is. Um, all right, so we're going to call this a state zero. Uh, this is going to be a state of the program counter and an initial signal of zero. And what had me hesitating here is that um, I can't really declare these other states until I have um, the return value of the previous computation. Uh, so this is going to get reassigned a lot of times and none of this is going to make any sense. Um, and this is pointing out more and more why I should have taken a different approach in the first place of doing the same thing everybody else does with solving this. So each of these is going to start at address 0 or address 2 after having loaded. I don't need to declare that here. I can declare it there. And then here this is going to go state 0.pc and we're going to assign the output to state 1. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we're going to want to mutate this this is going to be a new state based on state 1.pc, wherever the program counter last left off. Yeah, so this is what it's going to look like. We're going to assign state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, and state 0. Reusing the old program counter value, uh, but using the input uh, here. Now we see another variable signal. Um, so this is going to be state 0 dot signal. This is going to be state 1, state 2, state 3, and state 4. All right, so now what's my problem? Um, my problem is that I'm returning the program counter as well. Oh, 
Oh, hang on. This is getting uglier and uglier. Var state. Do I need to do, assign it a value? Yes, I do. Yuck. Okay. So I'm going to declare a thing. So... Okay, so I got this all backward. So we get a value back. The value we get back has both a program counter and a signal contained within it. State 0 is going to be a new state with the new program counter value. Uh, um, and I don't really care what the signal is in a given state here. So that's going to get overwritten soon enough anyway. And state 1 is going to be a state um, with state 1's program counter, but with state.signal. Um, so we're going to do that five times and try not to go mad in the process. So. Here we get a return value um, based on executing computer one. Um, yeah, and we're going to reassign state two and reassign state one. And down here, we're going to run amplifier number two, or the one in position two, two and three, and so this is going to be keep the program counter of wherever three was at, but use the new signal. And surely there's a cleaner way to write this, and I'm just like completely brain dead at the moment because I'm just furious about um, the nature of the assignment. If they had so many assumptions they wanted me to make, it, again, it would have been really convenient if they could have just told me those up front. Um, all right, and then we want to print line state dot signal. So question. This reassignment here, where I'm creating a new state 1, new state 2, etc., um, seems overkill. Can I just use signal instead? So we declared a var signal. Um, and the whole point of this is just to pass state 1 that signal into right here. So I don't need that intermediate thing. So we're doing all this just because, um, well, one, I'm trying to keep a functional programming style and try to keep uh, mutability out of any of this. Because mutability is where programs get weird. Uh, now, if all I'm trying to do is just pass a state.signal from one run to the next, I don't even need this intermediate assignment. I can just use state.signal and do away with all the intermediate assignments. So state.signal can be passed in from one pipe to the next here. But the important thing is that I keep uh, the program counter, uh, which I'll need for the next iteration of the loop. Um, so I'm confused why this highlighting is inconsistent. State 3 is assigned but never accessed. I feared that was the case, that 
All right. So, that's ugly. Does it work? Not quite. Um, do I need all these state zeros, etc.? No. I just need the program counter. Where am I using state zero? I'm using it. Yeah. All right. So we're going to try to destructure this in a better way. Four, three, two, one. All right. And then here, PC0 is going to get reassigned to state that PC. And I don't really care about the rest of that. So we've successfully um, passed the signal and are remembering uh, the program counter between runs. And at this point, I think I get it. Uh, we need memory one here. We need memory two, PC two. Uh, PC two is equal to state that PC three and four. Three, three, four, four, reassign three, reassign four, and then print out our signal as we loop back. <sighs> so, yeah, being bound by Java is a hindrance. but not too much of one. Not so great of one that we can't get anything done. So I printed out a 129. Um, wait, so if state.signal is the only way we're going to convey a signal back at this point, um, then this is probably where we want to start. All right. And then we don't have a variable signal anymore, so let's just do that. Okay, I think this will run and we'll produce a 129 here. Now this doesn't indicate whether or not the program's actually halted. Um, there is a mention that a program will halt. So let's anticipate that coming up soon. So you have a 129. Do we have anything after a 129? Nope. Get a zero. That's delightful. Um, Did I mess something up here? Should I have expected? Like, this is what I should have expected here for face setting 98765. It's not what I got. Um, Try to be a little bit idiomatic and not have a floating two all over the place. Uh, so what now? One twenty nine and zero. Yeah, I'm just at a loss. Like, unless a zero produces some greater output on the third iteration, and maybe it does, um, that this is not good. Yeah, so here, if this program receives a zero, 
with wherever the program counter is currently at, um, that's a problem. Now, when I run execute, am I returning the correct value of the program counter? That would be worth knowing. So we return PC and signal. This is not great. I don't understand. I could break this apart further. So this is, we're going to read into 26 um, and then add 26 with a value of minus 4. And then what? Let's store the result in 26 and then we're going to read into 27 and multiply the value in 27 by 2 storing into 27 so it's a doubler um, and then add up the values that are in 27 and 26 stored in 27 and then if um, 4 what's a 4 what is a 4 in my machine the four is we're going to output the value. Um, reading um, the value in 27. Um, 28. Well, okay, so four. I'm sorry, then we're going to add minus one to 28, uh, position 28 story in 28 and then we're gonna do 5 which is a branch I think where'd my 5 go yeah f yeah 5 is a branch I forget what kind of branch it is but um, <laughs> 5 is if the values are not equal, if this is not equal to 28, jump to 6. Otherwise, halt. So halt will... I'm not sure what value gets produced on halt if you rerun. I guess you keep the signal that you initially had. That bears some thinking. Um, I guess if your program's halted, it's on a fixed value. So can I find... Uh, input. I guess I want to set my signal equal to my input. No. Aye. Oh, maybe I do require the state here, not just the program counter. Fine. So this is equal to state.pc and signal is equal to state. No, because that's the input. We want the actual signal that was produced last time. Um, so we do need to differentiate between input and output. Because here we've got an input. Well... So we got a program counter and what else do we have? I think we have here an input.
so let's leave that be for a moment. Let's keep this as a one. And instead of calling this signal, because um, I'm doing myself a disservice there, um, Wait, get a PC, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay, I might actually want to feed both of those in. Um, so what was my last refactor here? It was to reassign these all back to a type of uh, whatever. There's no going back now. Um, so yeah, I want to have state zero this is equal to state of program counter two and output undefined. So I'm going to assume that once a machine has halted, it will continue to output. This is just a delightful mess of um, too much information and not in enough information at the same time. Uh, state zero. Uh, we're going to reassign to state zero. And let's see. Oh, yeah, I guess we can use the state four dot signal here. And perhaps that was my fault the entire time, but um, okay. Required an int, we get a state. Guess what? We're changing the signature of execute it again. State is going to be of types type state. And we're gonna say state dot PC. And we're going to remember uh, what our last signal we returned was. Um, and yeah, we're going to return a new state of PC and signal when we're done. That's OK. Um, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And the inputs here are going to be using four, one, or zero, one, two, and three. And at the end of all this, we're going to dump out what state four dot signal is. Of course, this breaks this contract again. Um, okay. Val state is equal to state two zero. So these all start with the same initial state. Uh, all right. Does I have anything else not compile at the moment? So an advantage to using data types is that if stuff compiles, you can um, make some assumptions about um, the validity of your program. All right, what have I broken this time? Forty eight warning memory one is never used. Oh, yeah, you're correct. Let's try that, shall we? Let's actually use the variables we declared. As fun as doing the alternative might be. All right, line 53, state one initializer is redundant. Oh, again, you're correct. Um, 
Interesting. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, yes, I am doing a redundant initialization here, because... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to try to use the value that's declared there, even though... Oh, that might work. So, had I known all the assumptions ahead of time, I would have completely avoided um, trying to do things in a functional style. I would have tried to avoid using a data class and just use a mutable structure um, instead of done things the hard way to see whether or not it can be done to see what the value and what the pain of immutability is and we're seeing a lot of pain the value hasn't yet shown itself but um, all right so memory zero so that is a mutable list but your state here ironically is immutable I don't know I'm trying to decouple these concepts in case I have to change things later it's also I'm not sure why I have a stray zero at the tail end of this execution um, probably that should read state 4 dot signal but state 4 is not initialized there um, so, oops, now this doesn't compile. Now it should compile. One twenty nine. Wait. Oh, so yeah, this is returning 129 on every iteration now. So we have separate mutable lists of the memories. We have separate states with program counters, etc. Um, But even if I like boost this up to some other number, I'm still going to get 129 because of whatever defect my software has. I did decouple the load operation from the rest, but I've completely whiffed on this. I guess it could be worth trying. Um, what happens uh, on this other program with the different set of phases. It's not going to work, but uh, it's worth a shot. And seven, eight, five, six. Okay. There we go. We're not going to get that number either, but um, Maybe we'll learn something, but probably not. I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah, so we have a 10. That's a different number. Um, the other thing I'm annoyed by is just like how ridiculously difficult it would be to unit test this stuff. Because they haven't given the specification to granular enough level that it's possible to unit test this. So this is the spec. This is more resembling the sort of thing you would encounter in the real world. And it's not such a joy to work with. Um, so I'm not sure what where to go next. Kind of wish I knew what to do. Wish I knew how to fix it. Reading the spec's not going to help any, so let's just keep the program as large as possible, but this is not going to help either. It doesn't explain why I have problems. So 
So this list is mutable. It does modify its own memory as it should. Um, yeah, state here for uh, computer zero uses memory zero and state zero. So there is this coupling of zero to zero, one to one here, etc. But um, uh, something we could do is print out um, state zero and state one, etc. I guess it wouldn't hurt to have more information. It almost certainly will not help, but um, couldn't hurt. So, um, you can see all the intermediate states at which we arrive. So, our program counter hits 25 and just emits a 5 and a 14, 31, and 64, and 129. And Unless I have some radically different interpretation of what this is supposed to mean. Um, eventually this will halt, and when this happens, the last output signal from amplifier E is sent to the thrusters. Your job is to find the largest output signal that can be sent to the thrusters using the new phase settings and feedback loop arrangement. Um, I don't know what largest has to do with anything. This is just get the value when it halts. And here we've got this infinite loop and we are halting and producing the same signals. I'm getting a 129 and you're getting some large number. And there's no way to break this down into a smaller problem. I mean, I could take this program and rewrite it in some other language, this three so let's read 26 and then add um, a value of minus 4 to 26. So the first value you can have a 5. And then you're going to take the value at 27. I'm sorry, you're going to read into 27 um, the input, which is a 0. And then your opcode is a 2, which is multiply. Multiplying a 0 by anything is not going to do anything. You store the result in 27. So you have a 5 and 26, a 0 and 27. Um, then you're supposed to add those values. So you're going to end up with a 5, store it in 27, and output the value of 27, which is a 5. Wait, no, 4 is a something. Okay, and the val if the value is equal to uh, whatever is in 28, then halt. Oh, I'm sorry, then jump back to 6. I'm starting to think that maybe these examples don't work. Because I'm not seeing how this number could be produced. So if... I don't get it. Like, so an opcode of four. Let me just check my opcode table again. Four is print out the value. So we're going to print out the value five. And then uh, 1001 is an add. We're going to add a minus one to the value in 28. Oh, OK. And then. 5 is if we've iterated through this five times. Um, on our fifth iteration, we're going to not jump back to step 6. So this can actually iterate up to five times. We do have five iterations here. Uh, they all happen to produce the same output, but maybe that's not by design. Um, yeah, so if I were to take a value of 129 and feed it in as the input, 6. This 
something wrong with my jump instruction, perhaps. Um, perhaps. <laughs> So yeah, this counts down from five down to zero, and then when it's actually a zero, then we don't jump. But otherwise, we do jump, or we should. Um, and we should jump based on um, six, an immediate mode of six, which would mean jump back to um, register six. Zero, one, two, three, four, so here back to this three which is read and input so it should jump back here um, note I am getting a program counter of 25 here and I should be getting a six so that's my problem oh I think my problem is I'm running these programs somehow to completion instead of blocking for input yeah, so that's where I messed up. So I'm assuming a fixed value of this signal as input. And that's just not what the spec calls for. Um, So that's my bug, and fixing it requires having breakfast, honestly. Um, I don't, I really don't think I can come up with a fast way to solve this or fix it, so uh, it's probably best that I break for now and give this a lot of thought and then come up with a way to pipeline these computers. Um, again, I'm trying to, um, one of my design goals is to limit um, state mutation. Obviously, programs these days do have mutable state, but to whatever um, extent I can, I'm trying to use immutable types to see, like, if I am going to use mutable types in Kotlin, uh, it really, there isn't so much of an advantage. Um, there is still some conciseness in this, but um, just imagine if this were in the middle of a very large stack of um, interrelated pieces of software, you would not want this to be mutating. Um, I'm already quite hesitant to use a mutable list, but I kind of have to here. Um, so I'll give this some more thought, but yep, um, it's not so easy. All right, um, so I guess I'm gonna break it there uh, so you don't have to watch me beat my head against the wall thinking about it. And it's not gonna be a matter of beating my head against the wall, it's just gonna be, I need to wait some time until the right creative idea concept comes to me um, we'll figure it out and reconvene how's that for a plan all right thanks for watching and we'll see you next time